Hi everyone, today we're going to discuss right ventricular systolic function. So the first way to assess right ventricular systolic function is qualitative and it's with visual estimation and really this forms a large part of your assessment of RV systolic function um, and it relies on your ability to discriminate normal from abnormal and that really comes from looking at a lot of echoes um, and being able to compare them and when you have looked at a lot of echoes kind of up towards 50 to 100 echoes um, visual estimation is quite a robust way of assessing RV systolic function and it forms part of, um, of everyone's assessment um, of RV systolic function. I'd also make the point that in intensive care we're really mostly concerned about extreme pathology or the extremes of function and what's important for us to know is are the, is the RV functioning normally or reasonably normally or is its systolic function really significantly decreased because that that has importance you know for our patients and how we treat them um, and as I said if you look at enough echoes um, heading into the future you'll be able to to make that discrimination satisfactorily. We can also use quantitative measures um, to assess RV systolic function and they can be global so visual estimation isn't really quantitative, but it's global. Um, we can, we're can we going to talk about RV ejection fraction, fractional area change, RV DP, DT, and myocardial performance index. Um, and we'll also talk about regional assessment of RV function, including TAPSI um, and tissue Doppler imaging. So firstly, 2D um, estimation of ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction, um, or EF, is an indicator of how efficient the ventricle is at emptying itself. We're very familiar with it with reference to the left ventricle, and it can be calculated the same way in the right ventricle. So we calculate it by uh, the equation end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume uh, on end diastolic volume, and then you times by 100 for a percentage. With the RV, the difficulty comes from estimating its volume. And it's difficult to estimate the RV volume because of its complex geometry. There are a couple of ways you can do it, which you can read about if you like, um, an area length method or a disk summation method. Both of these methods of estimating RV volume actually underestimate it. Um, there is a normal reference range for 2D ejection fraction. Um, in the RV and the normal value would be 44%. And you, you might read about this method, but it's not actually recommended um, because of significant heterogeneity and the numerous um, geometric assumptions that need to be made when trying to um, calculate and measure RV volume. Um, 3D EF estimation is better, um, but that's kind of beyond our scope, unfortunately. Fractional area change um, rather than volume change fares a little better and we can calculate the fractional area change um, in a similar way to volume change or ejection fraction. The equation is similar. So you calculate fractional area change by um, using end diastolic area minus end systolic area divided by end diastolic area. And to do this, you need to manually trace the RV endocardial border um, in the apical four chamber um, RV focused view, and you trace from the lateral um, tricuspid annulus all the way along the free wall to the apex and then back to the medial um, tricuspid annulus. And you do that in end diastole and end systole, and then you can plug those areas uh, into the equation. Um, the normal um, reference value or the, the lower reference value for normal RV systolic function um, is 35% fractional area change. And it actually correlates reasonably well when you're looking at RV ejection fraction by MRI. So it's, it, it's actually a, a reasonably, you know, reasonably accurate method if you do it well. And there's a couple of um, things that can make it inaccurate. The firstly is tracing the endocardial border. That can be tricky if you don't have good 2D images. And even if you do, it's sometimes tricky to identify the endocardial border um, when you've frozen your image. 
And it's important when you trace that you trace accurately and that takes some dexterity and practice, um, but also that you can separate the trabeculations and papillary muscles and know where the moderator band is and you actually should include all of those in the cavity area. Um, you also need to be aware of where you're cutting through the RV because the RV, as I said, the RV geometry is, is quite complex and where your image or your ultrasound beam cuts through the RV can have a significant um, effect on how big or small it appears. So you need to take some time kind of trying to optimize your image and panning through the ventricle so that you can capture it at its biggest and then measure and, and trace it at its biggest. That being said, um, even with those limitations, it is one of the recommended methods of quantitatively um, estimating RV systolic function. The next um, global measure is RV DPDT, and RV DPDT measures the rate of pressure rise in the ventricle, and this is validated as an index of ventricular contractility. It's used more commonly um, and has better evidence um, when used as a contract a measure of LV contractility, but it, it could be used in the RV as well. So for this, you need um, a TR, tricuspid regurgitation, continuous wave Doppler signal, and then you measure the time uh, required for the TR jet to increase in velocity from one to two meters per second. And then using the modified Bernoulli equation or the simplified Bernoulli equation, we can convert this velocity change into a pressure change and it represents a pressure change of 12 millimetres of mercury. Um, and then you can um, work out the DP DT and less than 400 um, millimetres of mercury per second is likely to be abnormal. Unfortunately, even though looks I kind of like the theory of this um, method but unfortunately it's not recommended for routine use in the right ventricle um, because of a lack of data in normal subjects it's also load dependent um, and you need a decent TR signal um, to calculate it Okay, MPI or myocardial performance index is a bit more complex. Um, it's, it's a global estimation of systolic and diastolic function and it's based on the relationship between the ejection and non-ejection work of the heart. And the MPI um, may also, you may also hear it called RIMP or right ventricular index of myocardial performance or the TAY index is another name for it. And it's defined as um, the isovolumic time divided by the ejection time. So that's the um, isovolumic relaxation time plus the isovolumic contraction time divided by the ejection time. And we can measure it in two ways. So the first way on, on this slide is with the pulse Doppler method. And to do this, we need um, method to do this method, we need two measurements. So firstly, um, ejection time of the RV is measured with pulse Doppler for RV, inflow, RV outflow, sorry. So you need to get pulse Doppler for RV outflow. Um, and then you just measure the time from onset to cessation of flow. Um, and that gives you the ejection time. And then next you need to work out um, the isovolumic time in total, which as I said, is the isovolumic contraction time plus um, the isovolumic relaxation time. The tricuspid valve closure opening time minus the ejection time is actually equal to this isovolumic time. And we can measure the tricuspid valve closure open time with um, pulse Doppler of tricuspid inflow. So it's the time from the end of the tricuspid A wave to the beginning of the tricuspid E wave. Or you can also get that tricuspid valve closure open time by measuring um, the TR jet with continuous wave Doppler and just measuring the, the duration of that jet in time, but you need TR for that. And then you can calculate um, the RIMP or the T index. And if it's more than 0.4, that indicates RV dysfunction. 
with this method, so the pulse Doppler method, um, just be aware that measurements are taken from a couple of different images. So it's important that you uh, use beats with the same RR interval. You can also calculate um, MPI with a tissue Doppler method. And this is done by using tissue Doppler um, with the cursor at the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve in the um, RV focused apical four chamber view. And so again, the tricuspid um, valve closure to open time is basically the time the tricuspid valve is closed. And that is the time from the end of the A wave to the beginning of the following E wave, which you can see in the diagram there. And we're not actually measuring the EA duration, we're measuring the time between them. And then the ejection time, so the ET, is represented by the duration of the S prime wave. So this is more complex, it certainly doesn't form part of my, oh sorry, before I go on, the, in this method the value is slightly different, so a RIMP greater than 0.55 indicates RV dysfunction. Um, as you can see, it is much more complex. Um, it certainly doesn't form part of, of my daily practice. Um, and I, to be honest, when I was learning, I didn't see it done very frequently. Um, but it does have some prognostic value in patients with pulmonary hypertension at a single point in time. And changes in the MPI can correlate um, with changes in, critical, in clinical status in those patients with pulmonary hypertension. But in the general ICU population, um, I don't think it's going to add very much to us. Um, you know, so it's difficult <laughs> to measure. Um, it's also um, unreliable when the RR interval is not um, constant. So if there's any arrhythmia at all. Um, and it's also preload dependent and can be unreliable when RA pressure is elevated. So that's that's kind of a lot of our patients, unfortunately. So it's recommended to be used um, in conjunction with other measurements, but not as a sole, not as a sole measurement, and it wouldn't be the first one I turn to. All right, so now we'll move to regional measures. So TAPSI, which is tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, is a regional measure of RV systolic function. So if you remember from previous talks, the right ventricle has superficial circumferential muscle fibers, which are responsible for the inward movement of the RV. But it also has inner longitudinal fibers that result in the base to apex contraction. And it's this base to apex movement or shortening that assumes the greater role in RV emptying. Um, and that's what we're trying to capture and measure with um, with TAPSI. So TAPSI represents the longitudinal function of the RV um, and it assumes that the displacement of the basal segment um, in the apical four chamber view is representative of the entire function of the RV. So you can you can see that that's not always a valid assumption um, to make. The way you do this is in the apical four chamber view, um, M mode through the tricuspid annulus, and then you measure the amount of longitudinal motion um, of, of the tricuspid valve annulus, and it's measured in millimeters. And it's likely to be, well, it is abnormal, the value is abnormal if that movement of that tricuspid annulus is less than 17 millimeters. Um, in newer scanning, you can also do it with tissue Doppler, but it's the same principle. Um, TAPSI has been correlated um, with, with radionucleotide angiography. Um, it's been validated against other measures of EF and RV fractional area change. It's pretty simple to measure and has reasonably low inter-observer variability. Um, and is therefore reproducible and you can you're less reliant on it on a very good image so there's lots of advantages um, disadvantages are as I said that it assumes displacement of that segment is representative of the, of the whole RV which may not be the case and and it's also angle dependent so 
you know, you want to have your cursor um, lined up with the, with the direction of movement of that annulus. Um, otherwise, you're going to underestimate and sometimes that's not possible um, with the 2D imaging. Um, but after all, you know, after saying all that, this is a, this is a, a quick kind of um, straightforward measure for us to use and it's um, reasonably robust and I, um, I do do it. So tissue Doppler imaging and getting an RVS prime um, is another way of assessing RV systolic function. And this measures the longitudinal velocity of excursion. So with TAPSI, we were actually measuring the movement in millimetres. Um, and with RVS prime, we're measuring the velocity of excursion of that same um, basal segment. And you measure this using pulse tissue Doppler. Um, and then with the cursor, place the sample volume um, at the lateral tricuspid annulus um, on the RV free wall. And again, you need to take care with the orientation of the, the cursor and the beam um, to avoid underestimation. So you want the, the direction of movement to be in the same direction as where your cursor is going. Um, S prime has pretty good correlation and, and good discriminative um, ability between normal and abnormal um, RV ejection fraction. If the velocity is less than 10 centimetres per second, um, then that is abnormal. Its advantages are it's simple um, and pretty easy to measure. It's reproducible and as I said, its discriminative ability is good. Um, the disadvantages again are that it's angle dependent, um, so you need to line it up properly. And again, it assumes that the function of this single segment is representative um, of the whole RV, and that doesn't always hold, unfortunately. Um, but this is a recommended measure, um, which, which you should attempt and um, try and perform. And as I said, less than 10 centimetres per second should raise the suspicion of abnormal RV function, um, particularly in younger people when they're, where there's a bit more data. So there are some other methods described of assessing RV systolic function, including myocardial acceleration during isovolumic contraction, um, regional RV strain and strain rate and two-dimensional strain. These are beyond the scope of my knowledge and practice, um, and some of them are more experimental than clinically relevant. But you, if you're interested, you may, you may go on to read about them, but they certainly don't form part of um, routine practice. So in summary, um, how do we assess the RV? Well, firstly, with visual assessment, as we discussed, which is a qualitative measure. And then it's strongly recommended that at least one quantitative measure is used. Um, and a combination may more reliably distinguish between normal and abnormal function. So if you can do more than one, that's a good idea. Um, the best ones for us would be fractional area change, TAPSI and S prime. I personally would do a TAPSI and an S prime. Um, I don't do fractional area change very much, but that's a personal thing. Okay, let's look at some examples. So first, we're just going to start with an example of, uh, this is a normal echo. Um, so this patient has normal um, LV and importantly, RV function just to help you get your eye in a little bit. So this is a parasternal long axis view um, and we can see the RV right at the top of the screen there. It's hard to comment on function in this view, um, but it's important to, I mean, this is where we always start. Um, and what we can say here is that the RV doesn't look enlarged in this view. Um, LV looks to be contracting normally. And there's no, you know, grossly ovulous valvular abnormality at this stage. So this is a parasternal short axis view at the level of the mitral valve, which is, it's kind of coming in and out of view a little bit. And here we look at the septum. You can kind of, you could argue in this that there's a bit of septal flattening, but we might need to confirm that in 
in subsequent images. You can also get an impression of RV size. And of course, LV function. It's hard sometimes to see RV function in this view because sometimes you can't appreciate the free wall of the RV. So if we move down a little bit beyond the mitral valve towards the papillary muscles, you can see that that, that septum looks more normal now. It's concave to the LV and RV doesn't look particularly dilated. So we'll move to the apical four chamber view. And you can see importantly that the RV is less than two thirds of the size of the LV, which is normal. And the RV free wall is coming in and out of view, but just take some time to look at this. This is kind of, this is normal contractility of an RV. So you can see the RV um, wall is shortening um, and there's vigorous movement of that tricuspid annulus towards the apex of the heart. And just zoomed in a little bit more so that you can have more of a look. And move more now to an R, more RV focused view. Again, this is demonstrating normal movement. And zoomed in a little further. Um, the RV basal diameter has been measured, which is normal. And then with tissue Doppler, the tricuspid valve annulus, the RV S prime has been measured, and that's um, showing 12, a velocity of 12.4 centimeters per second, which is normal. And this is a subcostal view, just looking at the RV at the top of the screen there. And again, you can still see that vigorous shortening um, from in the base to apex dimension of the RV. Pardon me, we'll just spend a bit more time there, which is all consistent with normal. So you would say based on visual estimation um, and a normal RVS prime that this patient has normal RV function. Okay, we'll move to the next example. So this is a parasternal long axis view again. You can see a few things here which I'll describe. So right at the top of the screen is the RV. It's kind of not completely imaged in the view and it's hard to make any real assessment about size or function. Underneath it we can see the LV, which is barely contracting, so significantly reduced LV function. There's a tiny pericardial effusion and also inferior to the descending aorta, there's a pleural effusion. And in the same patient, we've moved to the parasternal short axis view. You can see the tricuspid valve on the left, the aortic valve in the middle and the pulmonary valve flickering on the right of the screen in the RV outflow tract. And it does give the impression of an enlarged RV. It's reasonably difficult to comment on overall function in this view though. And then we've moved down towards the apex. So this is the parasternal short axis view at the mitral valve level which again is demonstrating significantly reduced LV function. The RV really isn't imaged adequately here, so it's hard to make any comment. Move down towards the um, papillary muscles. So this is the parasternal short axis at the mid-pap level. 
um, again showing reduced LV function um, and we can't comment on the RV here because we can't really see it. We're now in the apical four chamber view. Again, the LV predominates in this picture. So its function is significantly reduced and probably enlarged as well. We've been able to see the tricuspid valve annulus which is moving, but I certainly don't think it's moving as much as in the previous normal example. Um, and the RV free wall isn't imaged adequately to make any comment at the moment. In terms of size, again, it's hard to say because the RV free wall is not completely imaged, but you do get the impression that the RV is about the same size as the LV. So an RVS prime has been measured with, um, with tissue Doppler at that tricuspid um, valve annulus, uh, and it's showing seven centimeters per second, which is reduced, and that's consistent with what we saw visually. And we're in an RV focused view now in the apical four chamber, which is showing a little bit more of the RV free wall. And I think it's easier to appreciate here that, that that tricuspid annulus is really not moving towards the apex um, as quickly or as far as we saw in the, in the first normal example. The RV basal diameter has been measured and it's actually normal. And again, just trying to really optimize and um, see that RV free wall a bit better. And I think we can all agree that the function of this RV is not as good as the normal one we saw before. So this patient has reduced our RV systolic function. And again, just trying to optimize that image a little better. I think that confirms what we saw. The report, um, the report said that this patient had normal right ventricular size and they called it moderately reduced systolic function. Okay, next example, slightly tricky image. But again, in the parasternal long axis view, you get the impression that the RV is big here compared to the other chambers. Um, and the LV certainly is contracting. It's hard to say much more than that. And now we've moved to parasternal short axis view. And here we see a small LV, underfilled LV. We've got septal flattening and we've got a significantly enlarged right ventricle. And as we move down to the LV apex, you can still see the big RV wrapping around, which is abnormal. That indicates severe RV dilatation. You normally don't see the RV when you're down at the LV apex in the parasternal short axis view. And when I first looked at this echo, I thought they'd kind of cut through the LV in a funny way, but this is just, this was repeated. This is just how it looks. So it just shows a grossly grossly dilated um, um, RV, so se severe RV dilatation, where the RV is bigger than the LV and they're at the very least sharing the apex. And in terms of function, I think what's going on here is there's the apex, the RV apex is kind of pulling down and contracting. And what might be happening too is that the LV contraction is actually pulling the RV around, but it doesn't look like there's very much movement at all um, at the tricuspid valve annulus, and it doesn't look like the RV free wall is moving inwards. So I think the um, RV systolic function is significantly reduced. I just tried to optimize that image a little bit more.
And again, they've tried to focus on that RV a little bit more. So again, we can see here that the, the very tip, the very apex of the RV is being pulled down, it's contracting a little bit, but the rest of the RV free wall is really not moving much at all. Not contracting in its own right, it's kind of just being pulled around by the LV. An RV S prime was measured, again with tissue Doppler at the tricuspid valve annulus, uh, and that's significantly reduced um, at 5.4 centimetres per second. And that's consistent with what we were seeing visually. Um, and a TAPSI is measured as well, um, which is reduced. So the TAPSI is 1.2 centimetres or 12 millimetres, um, which is less than 17. So that's consistent. What we saw and what we've measured is consistent with a severely dilated RV with severe systolic dysfunction. And this is probably the best image that we've seen so far. So you can see that the apex is pulling down, the RV apex. The RV free wall isn't really thickening or shortening in the base to apex dimension. And as I said, that is consistent with severe RV systolic dysfunction. This sign or this pattern of contraction where the apex is, um, is contracting and pulling down, but the rest of the RV isn't moving very much, um, is called a McConnell sign, which is indicative of a pulmonary embolus. They did measure um, the RV basal diameter for what it's worth. It's five centimetres, which is um, enlarged, which was consistent with our visual estimation of RV size. Okay, next example. So again, tough image, um, which sometimes it is in the parasternal long axis. What can we say? Well, with the information that we have, the RV does look big at the top of the screen there, does look enlarged. Um, and I think it's pretty difficult to say much more about that. So we've moved to a parasternal short axis. Um, and this is at the level of the mitral valve. I think it's a little bit hard to see. But we can see a small LV and we can see a very enlarged significantly enlarged RV wrapping around the LV. Um, and there is some septal flattening. I'd have to slow it down to prove exactly where that was in the cardiac cycle. I suspect it's in diastole. Um, don't worry about the color over the valve here, but this is just to, to reinforce that the RV is significantly enlarged. Um, we can see the moderator band in the RV um, at the top of the screen there. And now we've moved to the apical four chamber view. There's a few things to comment on here. The first kind of distracting thing is the size of the right atrium. It really takes over the whole screen. When you look a bit more carefully, um, we can see an RV that's bigger than the LV and is probably the apex forming chamber. It's at least sharing the apex with the LV. The contractional looks a bit discordant. Um, I don't think the RV contraction looks normal, um, but it's certainly not as depressed as the previous example. And if we zoom in on the RV, again, I don't think this movement is normal. but it's probably not as severely depressed as the previous example. RVS prime has been measured, which is seven centimeters per second, which is reduced. And then a TAPSI has been performed and that's 1.2 centimeters or 12 millimeters, which is reduced. So those two measurements along with our um, visual estimation, I think they concur that there is um, reduced RV systolic function. All 
righty. Another example, so again in the parasternal long axis view, it's hard to make any comment about the RV here. This is looking at RV inflow. And again, I mean, it images the RV with the tricuspid valve in the middle there and a very big RA. Now we're in the parasternal short axis view. It's at the level of the papillary muscles. And this is really just to show it's sometimes really hard to get good images. You certainly in this view get the impression that the RV is enlarged, but we can't prove that because um, of the image quality and we can't see the free wall of the RV. We're still in short axis here, parasternal short axis view, down towards the pap level. The sonographers just tried to optimize that image. And again, it, it is tricky, but I do get the impression there that the RV is enlarged. And now we're in a apical four chamber view. Again, difficult, um, not the best image we've seen. And sometimes that's just all you have. What we can say is that the RA looks very dilated and that the interatrial septum is bowed towards the left throughout the cardiac cycle. And that indicates raised right atrial pressure. It's hard to say conclusively because the LV is difficult to see in this loop, but I get the impression that the RV is bigger than the LV and is at the least, very least, sharing the apex with the LV. And in terms of function, again, I don't think it looks quite normal, so I think it is reduced somewhat, but we'll need to have a look in um, a couple more views and make some measurements before more definitively uh, grading it. And again, they've tried an RV focused view to try and optimize that image. And look, there is annular displacement, annular movement of the tricuspid annulus. And again, trying to really optimize uh, the image to assess that RV free wall. And sometimes it can be very difficult. Getting there now. And this is what you have to do. It takes time trying to optimize that image. And eventually when we got that image, an RVS prime could be measured and I've cut off the values because of anonymity, but um, it's around 10, which is just normal. Oops, sorry. And then move to the subcostal which again is showing the dilated RV. Sorry, I'll just go back. So it's a bit easier to see here. So although the RVS prime is normal, given that visual appearance, um, that was reported as moderate systolic dysfunction, uh, which, which I would agree with. Right, finally, so again, we're in the parasternal long axis view. You can see a very thick LV here, which seems to be contracting reasonably normally. And you get the impression that the RV is enlarged. Parasternal short axis view at the level of the aortic valve. Hard to make any comment about systolic function here, um, but it's an important view for other parameters. And then we've moved down from the aortic valve level in the parasternal short axis to the mitral valve level. And this is showing kind of a small LV cavity, a very enlarged RV, um, and there's septal flattening occurring. And move to, sorry, I'll just make that loop a few times. Now we're in the apical four chamber view. 
which again is showing a very enlarged RV. So I think it's severely dilated given that it's bigger than the LV in this view and significantly reduced systolic function given this appearance. They measured the RVS prime and it was actually normal at 10. And you can see, it's a bit hard to see, sorry, but the, the annulus is moving, but the rest of the free wall doesn't seem to be moving very much. And that can be the problem when you're measuring, using a regional measure and trying to extrapolate it to the rest of the RV. And they've zoomed in. And so you can see again, the RV, uh, sorry, the tricuspid valve annulus kind of is moving from base to apex, but the RV free wall doesn't appear to be contracting well at all. So I would say that's kind of at least moderate systolic dysfunction. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Bye.